Right, welcome everybody to um, the 11.2 OrcaFlex user group meetings. Uh, my name's David Heffernan and I'm in charge of uh, software development uh, here at Orkina. And with me today, uh, I have James Powell, who is a um, uh, senior software developer. He will be actually doing part of this presentation on turbines later on. And we also have um, James Carlisle, Colin Lewis, Chris Heaton, um, uh, and these are the, the, the software developers that are uh, behind um, uh, the code that you have. Uh, they, they will be here manning the uh, Q&A and uh, helping to answer any questions that I can't answer, which may well be uh, quite a few. Uh, now, these, um, these are the second set of user group meetings that we've run in, uh, in 2021. Um, we held meetings in March for the release of 11.1. Uh, 11.1 was released uh, later than originally planned uh, because of the, uh, the big job of developing uh, restarts, which, which ran, ran over our usual schedule. Um, because that was a bit later than normal, we've had a shorter development cycle this time around for 11.2 to try and get back to our traditional rhythm of uh, major releases in, in the Q4 uh, of the calendar year. Um, because this has been a slightly shorter development cycle, um, than usual. Uh, the list of new features in 11.2 is a little bit less extensive than it was for 11.1, but hopefully uh, there will be developments in here that are useful to, um, uh, to a good number of, uh, of you users. So the pandemic uh, is still raging, obviously, and prevents us touring the world with these meetings. But in fact, we felt uh, from the first, uh, from the earlier meetings this year, we actually felt that the webinar format worked really well. Um, we were really pleased that it allowed a lot of people to attend that maybe wouldn't have been able to attend when we were going to a number of geographical centres. Um, the recordings of the meetings are very useful resources. Um, they're also, um, you know, less demanding on people's time, less demanding on your time, um, uh, and also less demanding on, on, on our time. So we felt that overall, actually, the webinar format is, uh, is, 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 is good, and we expect to continue these meetings in this format uh, in the future. If anyone has any questions uh, uh, as we go along, then, then please ask them in the, uh, in the Zoom Q&A. Um, uh, if possible, uh, my colleagues will be able to answer there uh, just in text. Um, uh, but if uh, the questions maybe are more challenging or in-depth, or maybe we feel that, uh, that uh, uh, will be interesting to, um, to cover uh, in a bit more detail, then we might hold on to them and answer them live um, at the end of the presentation. Right, I've just, uh, uh, hopefully you've been able to see the, uh, the contents, so uh, I, won't, I won't repeat that. I think you can all probably uh, uh, read it. Um, I will, though, uh, show the what's new topic in the help file. I always do this. Uh, whenever you get a new version of OrcaFlex, um, help, what's new, and we have um, the sort of the full list of of new features in this release of the program. Um, down at the bottom, we have some of the minor releases in the, uh, of the previous release, and some of those might have features that, that maybe you haven't got on. Maybe your company was stuck on 11.1c and you missed um, a couple of things in the later minor releases, so it's worth reading all the way down. Um, there's more in this list than there is in, the, uh, in our presentations today because um, we try to pick out the main most significant features in the presentation, but but there may be some smaller, uh, minor features down here in this list that will be be valuable for you. And if there's anything that we talk about today that you want to learn more about, come and find it in this in this list. You know, follow a link, um, and go to all the detail. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start by talking about um, seabed tangential resistance modeling and. Um, that uh, there's a, a number of changes we've made to the way Orcaflex uh, models interaction between lines um, and the seabed. And uh, just to give some background about what we've done here, there's, there's really two parts to this interaction. Um, there's the normal part and the tangential part. Now the normal part, um, the normal part is, is, is the, is the, the resistance to objects penetrating the seabed. It's the, it's the force that pushes objects out of the seabed. So 
uh, in Orcaflex itself, that's the um, the the effect that's controlled by this this data. The normal stiffness um, uh, pushes objects out of the seabed. That aspect of the program is unchanged. The the bits which we have changed are the tangential um, tangential resistance. The tangential resistance um, for line objects is what is um, uh, controlled previously by uh, seabed friction, Coulomb friction. Um, and we've made some um, new features. We've some, made some, some optional modifications to Coulomb friction, and we've added, added one big new feature. Um, and just on a, on a point of terminology, which is quite important, in previous versions of the software, um, when we consider the, the two components um, for the tangential resistance, uh, in previous versions of the program, uh, we called them normal and axial. Now, normal is uh, a little bit of a, um, uh, a confusing choice because, we, we, as I just talked about, um, the normal resistance is what's, what pushes objects out of the seabed. So there was a definite um, potential for confusion there. So we've, we've renamed that as lateral. So now we have normal pushing you out of the seabed and then the tangential resistance split into lateral and axial components. So just a, just a heads up of a, of a terminology change there. Um, let's, get, let's get on to the, uh, the actual um, behavior changes. And we'll start with a couple of changes to uh, Coulomb friction. And what we've, what we've done here is we've added um, two options. Um, I'm actually you need to have torsion enabled to see the second option. So these two checkboxes are what I'm going to talk about next. Um, the second one only applies when the torsion model is active. First of all, decouple at lateral and axial friction. Well, the um, existing uh, friction model has, um, as you saw in the data form, we have two uh, friction coefficients, the lateral and axial, and um, the friction um, force mu r um, is is just a single force, and we combine those lateral and, and axial friction coefficients by some process of averaging. It's, it's I'm not going to explain it. It's in the documentation, um, and that that force then acts to push you back towards where where, where the nodes came from. Um, a request we've had from users on and off over the years is to decouple that. It's uh, it's how things are sometimes modeled in other programs. So if you enable this. You can switch to a new model where we calculate two separate um, uh, forces, a lateral friction force and an axial friction force, using the, um, the two coefficients directly and apply them in a decoupled fashion. Uh, the other option um, that is new, apply contact forces at center line. I'm actually going to demonstrate this with a, um, uh, with a pre prepared model. And uh, in this model, I've got a constraint that has got, it's a curvilinear constraint. It's got an imposed uh, Y displacement that's a function of time and has a single three degree of freedom uh, rotation about X. So, um, and my line is connected um, fully built in to the constraint. Uh, and torsions included and I've not checked apply contact forces at centerline. So this is how the program behaved in all previous versions. If I run uh, the simulation, run the replay, you can see that um, as the line is being pulled along the seabed, um, the force is applied at the contact position at the, at the bottom, which generates a moment, um, a rotation, uh, ensues from that moment, and um, you see the line turning over. If I instead um, choose to apply the contact force at the center line, now the um, yeah, now the friction force is going to be applied here at the center. There's no no way to generate a moment, and you know, we look again, and we see 
Let's just drag it around. No rotation. So um, why have we done this? Well, if you imagine a um, sort of a, a very hard, maybe close to rigid um, surface that you're in contact with, then it wouldn't have penetrated this far. Maybe it's sitting right on top of the surface. And actually, the moment is, is, is reasonable. Um, so in that, in that scenario, then, then, um, then maybe you, you, want, you want this model. But if you've, if you've maybe your seabed is um, sandy, muddy, and you've got a lot of penetration, um, then it's not, it's not that simple um, uh, rolling on a, on, a, on a table kind of contact. Um, in that case, you might you might not want to have that th those moments generated. Again, this um, this change was uh, was something that came from um, user requests, um, and it's up to you um, what you want to do. There's an option. If you have the models of the of the data configured like this, then the behavior is uh, is identical to how it was in previous versions. Right, um, I'll move on now to um, uh, tangential resistance profiles. Um, and this is, this is controlled by the data in this table. And these, uh, these new data, they um, are applied in conjunction with um, Coulomb friction. So um, uh, you, can, uh, can, you can have them in addition to friction. Um, you can have them instead of friction if you set the friction coefficients to zero. Um, it's not an either or is, is what I'm trying to say. And um, we'll come back to what the, what the profiles look like later, but um, you can control on the line data form on this new seabed page, you can control which parts of the line um, have which properties, so which resistance profiles. So tilde here means the beginning of the line and tilde here means the end of the line. So in this configuration, any data I specify um, here uh, will apply to the entire line. Um, but I can do things like, I don't know, spill it up like that. So I can have, I could have different data for different sections on the line. Um, and it's fully decoupled. Um, you specify a lateral profile and an axial profile, and they are um, handled in a decoupled fashion. I'm going to show a pre-prepared example for this. And I have bring my workspace up. So I have a, a single segment line. Again, it's it's below the seabed. Just look at the data for it. Yeah, single segment. Um, it's connected to the constraint. The constraint uh, is another curvilinear constraint. So although it says we've got calculated degrees of freedom, in, in, in actual fact, there are no free coordinates. And uh, we're just saying y is a uh, function of time. So it's an imposed displacement, but it's an imposed displacement that we can do programmatically. We could have done this with time history, but um, this is, can be quite a, quite a neat way of, uh, of imposing a particular formulaic um, displacement. And I've got a couple of alternatives that I'll show in a minute that are commented out that I will uncomment in a, in a minute. What I'm going to do is I'm going to drive the line along the seabed and we'll see how the lateral resistance, the sorry, the tangential resistance. Um, um, I mean, it is lateral because um, that's, that's the only one we've specified in the data. We'll see how that um, develops and we'll infer that by looking at this graph of connection force. Okay. And if I come back again, we see across the whole line, we're applying this seabed tangential resistance, uh, which is a variable data item. I'll look in the variable data form. Um, here's my data. Um, we specify a dimensional displacement and a normalized resistance. Um, if I look at the, um, the plot, it's a, um, uh, it's a trilinear curve. And um, it's the whole, the whole idea here is to allow us to model um, more complex interactions with the seabed, fun, you know, to model phenomena like breakout, um, slip, the kind of things that you get when looking at uh, maybe sort of pipelines, um, um, uh, stability studies, things like that. And in this particular curve, 
as we start displacing from um, uh, from our initial configuration, we have a sort of linear buildup of resistance until we reach this point, the peak, and then beyond that is, is post breakout behavior. Uh, the resistance reduces till we get to a to a constant residual resistance. Um, that's that's um, fairly um, fairly straightforward. And if you look at uh, this model, if I run this model, uh, we can see that um, data being applied. Um, I, let's see if I can see this. Yeah. Um, here's my replay. The uh, line has been driven, displacement of 10 meters, and as it as it goes, then we see that the um, the connection force, which captures the the uh, the resistance force, matches the shape of the resistance profile. The numbers are slightly different. The the two here and four there. Well, that's because the data that that is specified is normalized. It's normalized by the uh, the normal resistance, which happens to be two, so that factor of two there um, explains the difference between those between those values. Uh, that's all fine with a sort of monotone increase in displacement. But what happens if we we displace and then we come back and and so on? Well, uh, I'll just demonstrate how how that how that is handled by uh, by the model. So that was our monotonic case, which I will comment out. And now we're going to unload and reload. Um, so here you see, uh, this is the displacement increases to, uh, well, four is where we, uh, we go into the post breakout behavior. Uh, we carry on increasing. Now we start decreasing and we, we do the part of the curve that's called unload. Um, then we increase again and we reload and then we continue on the original uh, original curve. And this uh, unloading part of the um, part of the curve is determined by the unloading stiffness. And tilde here means use the same um, use the same slope as the first segment of the of the data. I can put in a different value if I want. Um, that's actually going to be a slightly steeper um, steeper curve. So that's unloading, and then we finally going to consider um, uh, reversal. Yeah, here we can see the displacement graph. We increase monotonically to ten, and then we decrease uh, back down to zero. And as we we see traveling around the original curve. Now we go down the unloading section, and then we get back to um, zero resistance. And we go in the opposite direction. Um, we kind of start again, but in the opposite direction, we sort of flipped it over. Um, and this is this is a, a form of a sort of it's actually a hysteretic um, formulation. There's going to be some energy um, extraction here. Okay, so um, that's just a very brief. Um, uh, very brief consideration. If I uh, show you uh, from one of these data items, I press F1, we've got documentation of the data. Um, and there's also a, a detailed theory section with um, you know, equations, explanation, um, some motivation and references. Um, have a read of the documentation if you want to learn learn a bit more. So this um, this feature really has been it's part of um, a series of developments that we uh, we are working on to um, to, to, to hopefully lead to, to better improved modeling of pipeline and riser interaction with the seabed. We started in eleven point one with restarts, so um, I think you will use um, a static restart extensively with this with this sort of feature. Um, we've now added these uh, these resistance profiles. Um, uh, in 11.2, and in the next release, we are intending to um, add features to model expansion and contraction of pipes um, with variations in temperature and pressure. And we're also planning to have a sort of much more advanced contents and slug flow modeling 
to allow you to to better capture uh, the modeling effects that, that you've come out of a, of a flow assurance study so um, and after that, um, who knows, I think with those three um, major developments, we'll, we'll have a good start in, in, uh, in much better pipeline rise and interaction modeling. But as always, there will be um, user feedback um, as to how, um, how we might improve things further. Um, right, uh, that's all I'm going to say about um, the seabed modeling. I'm now going to hand over to, uh, to James Pell, who's going to talk about um, turbines. Uh, thanks, David. Yes. Um, good morning from me. Um, yes, I'm James Pell. I'm responsible for the development of the turbine object in OrcaFlex. And I'm just going to uh, present a, a short session here uh, um, covering and introducing the couple of main features we've added for this release. Starting with the main shaft stiffness and damping. So shown here, uh, hopefully you can see, is a schematic of the drivetrain model employed by OrcaFlex. Um, now, previously, the hub, previously in version 11.1, the hub was always rigidly connected to the gearbox, i.e. the main shaft, shown in red there, was essentially assumed to be infinitely stiff. Now, in version 11.2, you can optionally specify a finite value for that main shaft. When that's done, a new degree of freedom is introduced into the drivetrain between the hub and the gearbox, and it allows the hub to rotate relative to the gearbox about the um, drivetrain axis, um, which is labeled Z there. Now you can specify a special value of infinity. When that's done, the hub will be rigidly connected to the gearbox and you'll have just the same behavior as you previously had in version 11.1. .1. Now, if you have specified a finite value for the main shaft, then you'll also optionally be able to specify a linear damping to associate with that new degree of freedom. So let's have a little look at an example. Of this. So here I have a really a, a very trivial little turbine model. It doesn't really look a lot like a turbine, but if I have a look, it's a um, it's a single blade turbine. And I've set it up so that the generator is specified rotation with zero angular velocity. So for, for this model, for, for the whole simulation, the generator degree of freedom is always going to be fixed. If I come over to the hub page, which is where this new data lives then you see that it's set to infinity, which is the default behavior. And as discussed, that means the hub is essentially going to be rigidly connected to the generator via the gearbox to start with. Now, in statics, what I've done is uh, I've disabled statics. So in dynamics, the model is not necessarily starting in equilibrium. And I've also connected to the tip of this blade so that that's the hub up there. And this is the tip down here. And I've connected a 60 boy, which has got some mass, so some weight and inertia at that point. Now, um, when I run the simulation, what you'll see is not an awful lot, which we expect because there's essentially no degrees of freedom in this model at this point. The um, generator degree of freedom is fixed and the hub is fixed to that, as I said, via the, um, via the gearbox. Now, if I come back to the new data and add a finite value, in fact, I'll start with zero, what we're going to do is note that now we get the damping option come up as I discussed. Now it's going to introduce this degree of freedom into the model. And when I run the simulation, you will see that it's just going to swing like a pendulum about this new degree of freedom. So the hub is swing, swinging now relative to the, to the generator. If I come back and add a finite but non-zero value, then we will see that, I'll just run the simulation again. Now you'll see that the period and the amplitude have changed there. Um, if you just look at the drawing, you can see that it's no longer swinging past the bottom point. So it's so essentially acting like a harmonic oscillator with this new stiffness, restoring the hub degree of freedom back towards the immobile generator degree of freedom, which is locked, as I said, for the duration of the simulation. And finally, just to demonstrate it, if I add some linear damping in and run the model once again, you'll see that it acts um, like a, a damped oscillator. Now, obviously, the, these are not by any means real world values, but hopefully it just demonstrates uh, how this new degree of freedom is acting. Um, okay, so that's actually uh, all I'm going to say about this, this model. Um, hopefully, it's rather straightforward anyway. Uh, just to summarize, so essentially, 
You can now specify a finite value for the main shaft stiffness when that's done. A new degree of freedom is added into the drive into the drivetrain. That's been done because people wanted to be able to capture drivetrain flexibility. Um, and currently, uh, we will accept a linear value for both of those. But you can give infinity if you want to preserve the uh, previous version 11.1 .1 behavior. Um, right. Yes. Now on to the next feature that we've added for this release, which is user-specified shear center. Okay, so first of all, what is a shear center? Well, commonly it's defined as the point um, in the cross section of a beam, at which you can apply a transverse load and the beam will only experience bending with no twisting. So for example, if you had a, a cantilevered beam and you're gonna hang a weight off the end face of that, if you knew where the shear center was, if you could attach it just to that point, say on a, on a chain or a rope or whatever, or perhaps in you know, an terms, a, a point load applied perpendicular to the axis, if you apply it at that point, the cantilever is just gonna experience pure bending, no twisting down its length. If you moved off that point, then, then the beam is also, or blade is going to twist down its length as, as well as, as deflect in bending. Now, um, previously in Orca Flex version 11.1, .1, we only accepted the, uh, the location of the neutral axis in the cross section. And essentially, we would then assume that the shear center was at the same point, and this is where we would um, place the node. But in general, that's not always true. Um, it's true if the uh, cross section is symmetric about the neutral axis. Um, but because it's not in general tree, what we've now done is we will now accept um, both the shear center and the neutral axis specified individually. Now, with this new data, if you give the special value of tilde, then um, we will assume that the shear center is placed at the neutral axis, um, and then you'll just get the same behavior as you previously had in version 11.1. Um, but if you have specified a, uh, an, a shear center which is different to the neutral axis, then what will happen is that we'll now place the node there and the neutral axis will essentially be offset from the node. And that's gonna introduce a, a, an actual a bend tension coupling into the model. So once again, let's just have a look at a model where this, um, where this matters. So uh, here we have, there's actually three beams in this model, blades, if you like, but um, beams a white beam, a blue beam, and a red beam, which will, which will become apparent when I actually run the simulation. Um, and importantly, all three of these beams have their center of mass in the cross section lo located at their neutral axis. Um, once again, I've done the trick of excluding um, the system from statics. So at the start of this, this cantilever is not going to be uh, in equilibrium. And when I run the simulation, it's going to be free to fall and oscillate under gravity. Now, the first beam, which is, which is going to be the white beam, um, is modeled using the Orcaflex turbine object. Again, it's a single blade model. And if I come over to the blade structure page, um, this is where the new data shear center offset lives. Now, as with all other blade profile data, that's specified against arc length and you give the X, Y, edge and flat wise values as a percentage of the cord. It's completely consistent with all the other existing data. Now for this white, the white beam, I've left the value as uh, tilde, which is the default. And as I said, that means that it's going to take the neutral axis value. And as I previously said, the center of mass is also set to the same location. So for the white beam, all three cross-sectional origins are at the same point. Now, when I run the simulation, you can hopefully just about see that the white beam there for, for, for the full duration only oscillates in the plane. There's no twisting and there's no lateral um, tip deflection in the horizontal. Now, the blue beam is exactly the same. However, I have now specified a shear center offset. Now, um, this beam has a cord of two meters. So that worked out to be a, a actually works out to be minus one meter offset in both X and Y. So perhaps rather exaggerated. Um, but now we can see that the beam twists as it falls. And then you get this, de it develops a lateral tip deflection as well. And this is essentially ha happening because in the white beam, the, it, the inertia and the weight are acting through the shear center. So a bit like the load hanging off the point, acts through the shear center, no twist. But for the blue beam, the weight of the inertia is offset from the shear center, and it develops this twist as, as we discussed. 
Now, the third beam showed there, which is, which is hard to differentiate from the blue beam, has actually been externally simulated in NRL's um, OpenFast Beamline module. Now, if you're not familiar with that, that is a, um, a, a nonlinear time domain um, solver, and you can specify uh, mass and stiffness matrices um, six by six, so you can capture these couplings associated with these origin offsets. Um, and you can see the two structural solvers here match very nicely for this case with the offset shear center relative to the neutral axis. Um, now, the reason I've included that here is because the motivation for this development came about through studying a disparity in the um, IEA 15 megawatt reference wind turbine, the beam uh, Orcaflex versus Beamdyne representation of that. So not, if you're familiar with this, not the elastidine representation, which, which can't capture shear center offset or, or even twist, um, but for the beam down one versus Orcaflex, there was a, there was a disparity um, and we identified this was the issue. So that's why I'm also just gonna finish this um, section of the presentation by uh, showing the impact of capturing the shear center uh, on that turbine. Uh, so I'm sure if any of you are sort of into modeling turbines, you, you'll be aware of this resource, but through the uh, GetTub page, you can, Download the uh, reference wind turbine package. Included in that, amongst others, is, as I said, an open fast um, beamdyne data set. I took that data set, I truncated it at the RNA, so no tower or floater included in the model for simplicity, and I subjected it to a wind speed starting at five meters per second, incrementing over two and a half meters per second up to a wind speed well above rated. Um, I took that data set and then I built from scratch a, a model as consistent as I could be with Orcaflex. So whilst this is similar to the example you might have seen distributed for our website, it's not exactly the same model, because that example, I believe the input was pri primarily driven off Elastidine, it was actually a mix of resources, but this one I've really been focused on just matching the Beamdyne data set exactly. And I also built a third model, um, which is exactly the same as the Orcaflex, but I set the um, shear center to tilde because in that, that beam down data set captures this shear center offset. So that was naturally included in the Orcaflex model I built. And then I've set a third model to use tilde, which if you like is the sort of previous behavior. And then so the next few slides should show uh, how that impacts the rotor turbine behavior. So this is a, first, um, this is a plot, time history plot of um, rotor thrust. So on the x-axis there you have time, um, I, I, I've sort of drawn on and you can and labeled the different um, wind speed regions. So you can see it starts at five meters per second in a steady state, and then the wind speed suddenly jumps and you get sort of transient and it settles back down into a new steady state and so forth and so forth. Um, and obviously on the y axis there is the, th the thrust, and there's three curves shown. Now, the blue and red colors are quite hard to differentiate, but they are the Orcaflex in blue, version 11.2, if you like, with the shear center specified and the beam dyne in the dashed red, and they're almost exactly the same. The green dashed line is the Orcaflex where I've set the shear center to tilde, so where the shear center has essentially been set to the neutral axis. And you can see in some regions, as we approach the rated wind speed actually, which sort of is roughly in the middle of this time history, there's quite a large disparity in the thrust. Um, I think that worked out about 15%-ish when I had a, did a rough calculation. Now, as we flick through some other results of interest, um, you can see, so this is the power, this is the tip deflection out of the plane, and here is the um, root moment. They all tell a very similar story. Um, so for some turbines, in some wind conditions, um, it can be important to get these cross-sectional origins in the right place. Um, and, it, and, it, and it can have quite a, 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 bit, a, a significant influence on the rotor and blade behavior. Um, but that, now with version 11.2, that's much easier and more natural to do because we just you know, accept, the, accept the origin. So that's all I'm gonna say about um, those two uh, features. Um, I also just want to flag up that this year, um, we have updated the turbine example set concurrently with the release. Um, so there's the KO1 example, which actually remains unchanged. There's a small name change. Um, that one remains the five megawatt example of the NREL baseline turbine on the so-called high wind spar. But there's now a brand new KO2 example, 
which is the turbine on that is the IEA 10 megawatt, not 15 megawatt, the 10 megawatt reference wind turbine. That's on a monopower, monopower foundation. That's a totally new example that my colleagues built. built. And um, the existing KO3 example has been modified. So the turbine on that is the 15 megawatt, but it now includes pre-bend in the blades and the foundation has been swapped. So it previously had a monopole, but that's covered in the KO2. So we've, we've now mounted it on this humane semi-sub. Um, so it's a floating wind turbine example now, which is a lot more appropriate to a lot of our clients. And it's a really nice example now because the semi-sub's modeled using Orca Wave for the hydrodynamic data set. And the example covers the import of that into OrcaFlex, uh, including using the, the new inertial compensation feature um, to make that process easier and to avoid double counting, which David's going to discuss uh, in more detail um, next. So yeah, if you're into modeling turbines, then um, definitely check, check out the new example set. And uh, yeah, finally, I'll, I'll end this little, little section on turbines, just um, pointing out where we might go next with them. So here's a list of future developments. At the very top of that list, you'll see unsteady aerodynamics. Now that's things like uh, dynamic store. I am as close to 100% as I can be that that will make the next release. The development is essentially done. We're well into the testing phase, but given the sort of short nature of this year's receipt, um, release cycle, as David said, uh, you know, we, we were already released once this year. We couldn't really give it the level of uh, testing the feature like that really demands. Uh, however, um, we do anticipate that we'll probably be in a, in a position to release beta versions of that if people are very interested in that. Uh, if you are, maybe just get in contact, us, contact with us through the normal channel, channels or kino.com and let us know. And um, the rest of the list there is unordered, nor is it exhaustive. Um, some of the things we're looking at are things like initial rotor speed, so to start your simulation with the rotor, rotor audio motion. Although I suspect actually we might be able to handle that quite nicely through the restart, so maybe a, a nice example is what's needed there. Um, improved modeling of downwind rotors, that's a, a sort of UI model building um, improvement, a better structural model. So maybe um, we'll look at specifying structural data through six by six mass and stiffness matrices to allow um, more material couplings to be captured perhaps some blade fatigue module, adapting the turbine to be used sub C. Um, so obviously referencing the current, but also added mass and buoyancy. Um, yeah, Reynolds number dependent airflow data, um, had a couple of requests for that. Uh, maybe improve the coupling for other aerodynamic solvers um, and also further development of the example model because um, new reference wind turbine uh, models are, are expected to come out soon. Now there's lots of other features actually on our list. I couldn't fit them all on one slide. So I just picked a few out there. If you're interested in any of those uh, or any other for that matter, then please let us know um, through the feedback. Um, right, so that's it for, for turbines um, this year. Um, thanks for listening. Apologies for anyone who's not interested in turbines. Um, it might have been a tad boring. Um, and I'll hand back to David for the rest of the presentation. Thanks. Right, thanks a lot, James. Um, uh, so I'm gonna, as James said, I'm gonna continue by talking about um, um, vessel inertia compensation, which is a, uh, which is a new feature that, um, that we've added for this release. So um, let me just, um, share my screen. So the um, the motivation here, vessel inertia compensation, is really um, it's, it's a it's a convenient feature um, for handling uh, data preparation when interacting with diffraction packages. So um, it it is useful um, when you have uh, floating bodies that you're going to model in OrcaFlex and calculate, calculate the motions of those bodies. Um, but the bodies themselves have um, superstructures, um, significant superstructures that um, are modeled explicitly in OrcaFlex too. So examples of that might be transport, installation, decommissioning of, uh, of heavy topsides, um, floating wind turbines, um, and in fact, I'm going to demonstrate it with uh, an example of floating wind turbines. It's not the only um, situation where you might use this, but it's uh, it, it's a good uh, it's a good example. Um, now, the the scenario here we have um, if it's a, a floating turbine on a let's say my example here is a semi platform. Um, you have 
the platform, you have the tower, you have the turbine itself, uh, and the, the superstructure, the, the tower upwards, um, is a, has a significant mass and a significant impact on the motion of the overall um, system. When you do a diffraction analysis, if you, if you need um, uh, to calculate motions, um, then you need to include the, the mass and inertia of the superstructure. Um, even though it's not um, uh, submerged, it's not subject to, to any loading from the, um, uh, from the fluid. Um, if you're calculating motions, then, then you need that, um, that superstructure the, um, in the model, in the diffraction analysis. And you calculate motions if you want motion areas, but you also need to calculate motions when you're doing diffraction if you need um, QTFs. So whilst um, I, I talk, you know, I said we would maybe we would be going on to do calculated vessel motions. Um, for some parts of the hydrodynamic data, you still also need to calculate um, for the first order motions in the diffraction solve. So uh, here's how uh, this model illustrates how we used to do it, uh, and we've got two different um, two different variants of the model. We have. Uh, what's showing at the moment is the included superstructure. So I've I've done a diffraction analysis in Orca Wave. I've imported the hydrodynamic data, and when I set up my my Orca Wave uh, model, uh, we you know we included the um, the turbine, the tower, and so on. And that's in this vessel type. And we can see a. If I just go to the structure page, we can see the mass. This mass, fourteen e three, is. Uh, the mass of the platform and um, the tower and the turbine. However, um, if I just hide that and show the other one, if I'm going to then model um, model the actual turbine in Orcaflex, I also include, you know, a tower and the turbine object um, and the nacelle all um, um, have significant mass. Um, in fact, if I select them all, all together, right click properties, um, we have a mass of, of 600 tons, um, which is significant. And the potential here is, um, potential problem is that we, 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 we could end up double counting this. And at the moment, unless we do something about it, we will double count it. We've done our diffraction analysis. We've included um, the mass of the platform and the superstructure. We've built the superstructure as explicit models in Orcaflex, and now this part from the tower up, we've double counted that, that mass. So what we do is we adjust, um, you know, this, this vessel has, it, has this vessel type, explicit superstructure, look at this vessel type, and the mass is slightly different. In fact, it's 600 tons less than um, uh, the first one we looked at. And that's because we've we've compensated for um, uh, the explicitly modeled structure. It's not just the mass you need to change, you also need to change the moment of inertia tensor, uh, the center of mass, and you also need to change um, uh, some of the hydrostatic stiffness. Um, it's quite complicated to do. So in theory, oh, just subtract out the mass of the, of the the uh, the superstructure. It sounds easy to say that, but it's actually um, a little bit more involved. If I just show you um, how we used to do it, uh, we provided a spreadsheet. Here it is. Quite an advanced bit of Excel with arrows. I didn't even know you could do arrows in Excel. Um, someone else, someone else built this. Um, and uh, we've tried to like make it relatively um, straightforward to use. We guide you. You have to input all this data, the total data, the superstructure data, um, and then um, over here is the data that you would push back into, into Orcaflex that's, that's been um, compensated. There's also a, um, similar for the hydrostatic stiffness. So this was how we did it previously. You would do a manual sort of pre-processing of the data is quite um, uh, fiddly, quite easy to make mistakes, um, and and you know if you ended up doing things like reperforming the um, the hydrodynamic analysis, you'd like maybe um, remeshed your your archive model or you introduced some different 
um, you know, some different um, wave periods and you, and you re-imported your hydrodynamic data, you'd have to then go and reapply those, those changes. So it, it was a slightly messy way to work. So what we've done in 11.2 is we've um, built this process directly into the, uh, into the software. Uh, this is an 11.2 way of doing uh, the exact same thing. Now, uh, our vessel type, if we look at the structure, that's um, this data is, has been pulled in from the diffraction analysis with the superstructure mass included in the, in the hydrodynamic data. So the full um, platform plus tower plus nacelle plus turbine is all in this mass, moment of inertia, et cetera. But also on the vessel data, you can now go and specify um, here, you specify the data um, for the, um, the, the, the mass data that is explicitly modeled elsewhere in the model. Because we've, we've, we've included this elsewhere, we specify, um, that's the, the, the figure we saw before, around 600 tons. We specify that data here, and the program will automatically compensate for it and, and kind of remove it from the, uh, from the vessel before you do your analysis. So it's a much more convenient way of working. Um, the final thing to say is, you know, where do you get this, this information from? Well, that's actually, um, uh, I kind of alluded to it before. You select the objects in the model browser that uh, are explicitly modeled. You right click, select properties. You get what we call the compound properties report for that object, which includes the, the mass. Um, the, trap that you have to be wary of is that this data must be reported um, uh, relative to uh, the vessel. Um, so what you can do in this, uh, in this form is select which object uh, it's reported relative to. And um, in previous versions, you would only be offered the top four here. You would only be offered the objects that are um, that are in the compound properties that we're considering. But for 11.2, we've extended this to include all um, reference points in the model um, purely um, to help you do this. So I select my vessel. Uh, you saw the data change there. Um, I would then export that. Um, just going to drop it on my desktop. Export as an Excel file. Um, Ready to appear um, on my other on my other screen, and I would then take this data, copy it, um, you know, paste it into Walkerflex in here, and so on. So that's that's um, that's all you need to know about that, um, and hopefully that will make this this process more complicated. I've illustrated it with turbines, but as I said before, it can be for other other applications. Okay, I'm going to now look at that's those are probably the, the most significant major features uh, in Orcaflex now when we're going to do the, do a mop up of maybe some some slightly smaller developments. Um, here we have a vessel with some supports. Um, this contact just set it up so you can see it all. Um, I'm using the simple geometry specification where I, I define uh, a path along which the supports are laid out. Um, and this, this is not a new feature. What is new is that uh, previously this curve always had the same sense. It always curved in the same direction. You could never have a reversal of curvature. But now you can see We've got curving down, curving back up, then curving down. And that's triggered by um, allowing the bend radius to be signed, which is a slightly, I mean, it's a slightly odd, uh, odd thing. I mean, the bend radius really is, is, is always a, a positive value, but we've used, adopted the convention that the sign of the bend radius data that you input indicates the direction of, uh, of curvature. So, I mean, if I change that to 70, then you can see uh, it's all in the same direction, minus 70. So on. Okay, that's all that needs to be uh, to be said about that. I think. 
Um, right. This next development is uh, is driven a little bit by uh, by some changes in Orca Wave. Um, we have a, a a second webinar uh, next week on Thursday where Chris will be talking about um, uh, the developments uh, in eleven point two to Orca Wave our diffraction code. Uh, I'm going to slightly steal steal his thunder on one of the developments, um, which is now that um, wavefront obj files um, uh, can be used uh, as panel mesh files in in Orca Wave, and that in turn means that we can use them um, for the import wireframe feature. So this import wireframe feature, where we import wireframes from panel mesh files, uh, is Kind of like an overlap with with Orca Wave. We needed the facility for Orca Wave. Um, we thought it's going to be useful in Orca Flex too, so we've we've mapped it across into Orca Flex. And whenever we add a new panel mesh format in Orca Wave, then this feature in Orca Flex also um, uh, uh, changes. So here I've got an example. Uh, this is a, a wavefront object file. It, they tend to be used more for sort of three D modeling and and um, uh, and graphics. But a lot of um, CAD packages will export uh, obj files, and so we thought it was useful to to include them, uh, include support for them in our codes. Uh, if I just import that, you can see the data's come in, and now we have this. Yeah. Okay, um, that's pretty straightforward, uh, pretty simple. But it, it has led to um, changes in the other area where we have um, uh, object file support in, in OrcaFlex, which is in the uh, shaded drawing um, uh, support. So with a number of objects, vessels, boys, um, solids, possibly some others, um, you can specify a shaded drawing file, a .x file, a .obj file, or, in, or indeed a panel mesh file and um, OrcaFlex will will use that when you're in um, uh, shaded shaded mode. So in order to illustrate this, I'm actually going to uh, bring up um, an old version of OrcaFlex 11.1. What we realized when uh, when supporting obj files for panel mesh um, is that the way they're supported for um, shaded graphics was slightly um, inconsistent. So if I just browse to this uh, object file, this object file, which is a uh, OC6 semi, right, if I look at the, the 3D view, then there it is, um, in shaded, shaded mode. So kind of, Swanky. Um, in eleven point one, we assumed um, a, 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 di a different um, sort of set of conventions um, for the, the coordinate system for uh, for obj files when we imported them this way. But in in uh, eleven point two, when we when we worked with importing them and using them for Orca Wave, the convention in Orca Wave is that the panel mesh file will have the same coordinate system as Orca, Orca Wave, um, and indeed Orca Flex, which is a right-handed system, Z vertically upwards. This obj file, um, I think it's it's left-handed and Z is uh, Z is, is is in a in a horizontal direction. So it's a different convention system that's not ours. And in previous versions, our code kind of adjusted for that and, and assumed that was the default convention. But obj files can exist with with any different convention. You've always been able to, on the data form, you know, rotate them around. If your object file doesn't have the right convention, then you can rotate it and and make it work. Um, if it's if the if it's flipped in 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 one plane, if it's a right-handed or left-handed, then you can mirror it to to correct that. Um, so there's always been um, uh, an ability to to adapt to an object file that doesn't have a convention that matches our assumed convention. But in 11.2, we wanted you to be able to um, uh, use an obj file um, for wireframe import and for shaded drawing and have the same uh, assumptions about conventions. But that wasn't possible the way we did things previously. 
So if I uh, if I just demonstrate this, if I um, if I go to eleven point two and I do exactly what I just did in eleven point one, um, bit of shaded drawing, bring in the same object file, um, switch it to um, to shaded. We'll see that the 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 object the object file has come in. The shaded uh, graphics model has come in with. Uh, a different orientation, uh, uh, and that's because um, we're in eleven point two. We're assuming um, a different default um, set of conventions. We're assuming that your object file will have um, Oracle Flex coordinates, Z vertical upwards, right-handed system. Now I can change this. Um, I think this is what I need to do, um, and I get the same as. Um, in, in, in uh, 11.1 but as uh, if, if you have any trouble working that out what I can actually what you can actually do is is Orcaflex will do that conversion for you um, if I save this I'm just going to save it to my desktop save it as a binary DAP file I come to 11.2 um, I open open that same file in 11.2 so I've saved it in 11.1 where the orientation was um, and the drawing looked correct. Um, open it in 11.2, and again, it's now correct. So the binary data file understands the compatibility. And um, behind the scenes, um, OrcaFlex, when loading it, has said, "Ah, this data comes from 11.1, which used a different set of conventions. I will correct them here." Um, so you might encounter problems when you're building models from scratch. You might need to to put in some some values here that you aren't used to doing. But if you're transferring a model from an older version of Orcaflex to a new version of Orcaflex, and you're using the binary .dat file, then all of this will be handled uh, handled for you. So you may get a bit of confusion, um, but hopefully um, you will remember this and you can go back and look at this presentation on the on the recording, and it'll it'll give you some some indication of how to um, how to sort it out. Right. Um, I want to talk now about um, fatigue analysis and histogram collation. And um, the main new feature uh, in this area relates to um, frequency domain um, synthesis, which is um, which a feature which I probably need to do a little bit of a, of a refresher. I'm going to do a, a little bit of a refresher to, 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 um, so that we can discuss the fatigue aspect of it. So um, let me load my example. Uh, okay, here you go. So here I have a, um, and it's not a realistic case because it's been put together by me. I know nothing about sensible values for real physical systems, but it's a, um, uh, just to get across some concepts, it's a lazy wave system with a, with a you know, riser with a buoyant section. And I've done this analysis in the frequency domain, uh, wave frequency, frequency domain, um, which is maybe a little bit unusual for a system like system like this. But actually, the wave is 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 pretty benign. It's a significant wave height of one, relatively um, benign uh, environment, um, and for benign environments, uh, models like this, frequency domain might be able to do quite a reasonable job um, of, um, of predicting response. Um, synthesis, now normally when you do, uh, do fatigue analysis, your results of interest are things like statistics. I'm going to look at statistics for uh, tension at the top end, and we see um, standard deviation, and um, that's probably the most important value. I'm, I'm not interested in extremes because this is a fatigue load case. Um, so, um, and then the other uh, result that, that is often of interest would be spectral density. Um, if, you do, if you were doing a fatigue analysis in the, uh, uh, in the frequency domain with a spectral analysis, this would be the, um, the main driver for that uh, damage calculation. However, you can in Orcaflex, um, although this analysis is entirely done in the frequency domain, you can uh, synthesize time histories where we create a single um, uh, explicit realization of 
um, of, a, of a town domain um, and our, uh, town domain histories. So I can come and create time histories, even though this this was done in the frequency domain. I can specify some some periods, and we synthesize um, uh, time series using the uh, results transforms. Um, now, this can be useful um, sometimes to get um, if you if you need if you have other post processing um, for, uh, processes that require uh, time histories. Um, you you may find it useful to do the analysis using frequency domain for efficiency, uh, but then synthesize time histories um, from it. Um, and that's what we're going to demonstrate. Uh, that is now possible with our fatigue analysis and our histogram collation um, features. So I just want to uh, also show some uh, comparisons. Um, yeah, so this is uh, the top tension uh, time history that we just looked at. Uh, the orange curve is the one we looked at from the frequency domain analysis, but I have um, also repeated the same analysis in the time domain. And you can see for, um, for HS1, for that wave condition, it's a pretty decent, uh, pretty decent match. If I gradually increase the uh, wave condition, then um, we get further and further away. Okay. Um, which is what we'd expect. Um, a linear um, frequency domain analysis is going to be worse when your system has, has more nonlinearities and your system will have more nonlinearities, uh, more significant nonlinearities when the um, wave, uh, wave condition is more severe. I just want to, want to make sure that this yeah, actually is 11.2, right. Um, now I'm going to open some fatigue analysis. Um, we have four analysis types. Um, the final one, uh, the response REO spectral approach, I don't really want to talk about because it's it's really generally not to be recommended. There's very very few scenarios where um, where it's it's a uh, an appropriate and a, and a good method to use. By and large, it's the top three that are that are um, effective, and the spectral frequency domain. Uh, option here um, requires your load cases all to be frequency domain and the other two require uh, in 11.1 at least require all your load cases to be time domain however in 11.2 um, as you can sort of see here where we have a frequency domain load case in 11.2 we can do rainflow counting with a frequency domain load case rainflow counting requires time histories it is very much a time domain damage calculation method but what we can do in this scenario, in 11.2, if you have a frequency domain uh, load case, we will synthesize time histories over the simulation period you specify and then feed that into our rainflow counter. So now I'm actually able to mix and match frequency domain and time domain um, load cases in one analysis. I go back to my uh, comparison. Uh, I have some damage um, comparisons. I'm, I'm looking at Rainflow uh, using rainflow using synthesis from frequency domain analysis, classic um, pure time domain rainflow where the analysis was done in the time domain, or spectral where we do a frequency domain analysis and use the spectral density and Derlich's method um, to, to, to come up with a damage. For HS1, this is a really good um, looking comparison, um, but as uh, the wave conditions get more severe, we see that um, the methods based on frequency domain get further and further away from time domain. So uh, what, what I suppose the conclusion here is that uh, you may find that for performance reasons, the, the majority of your load cases or a significant portion of your load cases can be accurately captured by a frequency domain analysis. Um, but some of them, the more extreme ones you need to do um, uh, rainflow with the analysis in the time domain, um, the new feature allows you to mix and match. 
Uh, what would be what would be really nice, I suppose, would be if you could um, maybe have this analysis type drop down into this table, and you could do different types of analysis for different load cases because the spectral, you know, if you can do, if your frequency domain analysis uh, for your load case captures the response um, accurately, then it's much more efficient to do a pure spectral analysis rather than synthesis, efficient in terms of um, calculation time. So um, some point in the future, we might well allow you to specify per load case um, analysis type, um, which would be, I think, quite nice. Um, everything I've said here, I've talked about um, for fatigue, but it also applies for histogram collation. Um, that's another rainflow based method so that uh, the synthesis can be used there now. And the other thing that's new with, uh, with fatigue is that the API has been extended significantly. So previously, and it's been something of, a, uh, of an embarrassment, um, the API didn't uh, offer any dedicated ways to extract results. You had to um, pull out um, the result into an Excel spreadsheet and then parse them with some code to read spreadsheets, which is kind of horrible to do. Um, now from 11.2, you can uh, extract these results, um, damage, and et cetera, uh, into multidimensional arrays in Python or MATLAB in a very similar way to, uh, to how you do for ArcWave. Um, we don't have any examples of that yet, and uh, one of my jobs coming up is to extend our uh, Python API introduction document to include an example that uses this new API. Right, um, I'll just talk a little bit about our Shear 7 interface. Um, after we released 11.1, um, there was a new version of Shear 7 released, 4.11, and over, um, uh, we, we actually work uh, quite closely with AMOC, who developed Shear 7, um, and over a number of minor releases um, in 11.1, we've uh, added support for 4.11. All of that is, is available in both 11.1e and 11.2a, so if you, if, you, if you aren't yet able to upgrade to 11.2 or you're you're doing a project in 11.1, um, as long as you get the latest minor release 11.1e, which we released uh, at the same time as 11.2a, um, then you'll have all this functionality as well. And then the changes, uh, I'll just run through them quickly. Uh, the In 4.11 in Shear 7, uh, all the uh, files have got an S7 prefix on the, uh, on the file extension. So the input file that used to be .dat is now .s7.dat and the uh, modes file used to be .mds, it's now .s7mds, and um, Orcaflex now uh, understands that. There's a new stress time history output file, uh, which has some, some input data that's fed into the Shear 7 uh, data file, you can specify that there. And there's also the, the, the big new feature in, uh, in 4.11 was stick slip hist hysteresis. Uh, and here again, there's a, there's a bunch of data that you, you can specify in Orcaflex that's then fed through to, to Shear 7 itself. This just, just mirrors the, the data in Shear 7. And associated with the stick slip hysteresis, um, that feature relies on um, a change to the modes file. Previously, when Orcaflex generated the modes file, um, uh, we did not um, calculate mode slope. We always output zero, and that was and that was fine in previous versions, but if you're using stick slip hysteresis, you really need, you have to have the mode slope included. So now um, in the latest versions of Orcaflex, mode slope is included in the modes file. So those are all the changes to do with, uh, to do with Shear 7. Final thing I want to talk about is, um, is Python. Um, Python, uh, we now support um, version 3.10. Again, 3.10 was released after we released 11.1. We've added support for that in version 11.1e. That support is also available in 11.2. I would imagine exactly the same thing will happen in the next release cycle. There'll be Python 3.11, and we will add that in a, in a minor release to 11.2, and it'll also be available in, in the next major release. More importantly, though, I just want to flag up that 11.2 um, is the final release um, that will support uh, Python 2. Um, Python 2 has been um, deprecated and not 
developed and not supported by uh, the Python developers for um, some time now. Uh, we've flagged this up before, but um, for the future, um, we will only support Python 3.6 and up. Uh, most of the support we do um, these days is with people doing Python, Python 3. I, I, I suspect there's not that many people left on Python 2, but if you are, um, here's your early warning that it's, it's time to, to, to migrate uh, away from Python 2. Okay, um, uh, that's the end of, uh, of our presentation. Right, I'll wrap that up, up there then. Thank you uh, very much for your continued support um uh over the years uh thanks for attending um please do um uh, give us the give us the feedback um uh, uh when you get the chance and uh, we look forward to uh seeing many of you uh next week at the uh, the orca wave session okay thanks very much <laughs>